Hello and welcome to another edition of A Walk Through Philippians. We are in uh, episode 43 and we are looking at Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 and 11 today. I really see the book of Philippians as a mountain range. It's a, it's a, a beautiful thing to walk through and that's why we're calling it A Walk Through Philippians. There's so much to see, so much to experience, so much to uh, glean and grow from this incredible book in the Bible. Uh, I want to say today, if this were a mountain range, we would really be ascending something of a peak today, something of a, a climactic point in this book. And uh, the view from up here is amazing. Uh, so I'm really excited for this verse uh, that we're going to look at today. Anytime we get to uh, a point in the scriptures where there seems to be something of a, of a summary of the gospel, something of the essence of the gospel coming through in a single a precise statement or verse, uh, it's a very precious thing. And I think that's why we love uh, John 3.16 so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And there's such a beautiful uh, 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 capturing the essence of the gospel. And of course, it doesn't say everything, but it says so much in one statement. And, and here today in Philippians 3 verse 10 and 11, we see Paul revealing the, the object of his desire, the, 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 the reason for his goal, what he is straining and striving towards. In this uh, chapter 3, uh, he's got to this point where he, he says, don't put confidence in the flesh, but, but put confidence in God. And, and this is my goal, he says. And he starts pointing towards what his goal is. And, and here he summarizes it in Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 10 and 11. Let's dive in there together. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. This is a a remarkable statement, as I said, and as I'm sure you can see, we we see he's spoken about this goal already in Philippians three. His goal is to to know Christ. He he considers the the wonder of knowing Christ, and and compares it to everything else. And and here he describes something of what this knowing Christ is, not just knowing him generally, but there's this, this intimate knowing of him and experience of him. And he describes it like this as knowing the power of his resurrection. That's, of course, of Christ's resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's Christ's sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. And so we see this uh, a beautiful cadence in the statement where he, he talks about um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, resurrection and sufferings. He speaks then about death and we see uh, a laugh, this resurrection from among the dead. So you 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 lift it up and you brought down and you brought down and you lift it up. There's this 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 beautiful dynamic that we see at play in this statement. Uh, we we see him talking about uh, power. There's this power that that he's speaking about. Uh, we see him speaking about fellowship. Uh, we we see him. Uh, speaking about being conformed to death and and uh, uh, attaining or, or reaching resurrection from among the dead. We're going to lean into a, uh, a, a another passage of his writing in the book of Romans. But I first just want to look at this this word assuming. It's, it's, uh, for me, it stands out as, as a bit of an odd word. Uh, when Paul is so confident, we know in in, in chapter one, he says, I'm certain of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. There's always a, a kind of certainty with Paul. So why use this word assuming here? Now, I, I think I prefer the ESV translation. In this that It says, uh, uh, being conformed to his death, that by any means possible, I will uh, reach or attain the resurrection from among the dead. And I think when we see this here, we we're just seeing this this uh, 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 Paul not seeing fully how this is going to happen. He knows that he must be uh, joined to Christ in his death, 
and and, and there is a a sharing in Christ's suffering. Uh, he he understands uh, that that he he must be uh, united with Christ in his death, that he may enjoy resurrection with Christ as well, and the new life with Christ as well. And 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 I think this word here uh, is, is is saying uh, the ESV says by any means. It's it's meaning I don't necessarily see how this is going to work. I don't necessarily understand the mechanics of how God does this. You know, in, in, in Romans he, uh, 11, he just says, oh, how unsearchable are your ways, O oh Lord. There's, there's this unsearchable um, uh, uh, elements to how God does things. And, and quite often we, we, we see points in Scripture where we, we don't understand, Lord, how do you do this? Uh, for example, uh, as we're reading this, this book of Philippians right now, I would ask you, who is the author of Philippians? Uh, some would say, uh, Paul, Brian, you, we've spoken about this. Um, others would say, no, no, Brian, uh, it's the, the Holy Spirit. It's, uh, God breathed, these words of God breathed. And so which is it? Well, of course, it's both. We know that Paul wrote it. We know that he was writing as a person to other people. He wasn't uh, in some sort of trance. He was writing a personal letter. But at the same time, and in an absolutely uh, 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 through sense, God was working through him, inspiring him as he as he wrote this and inspiring the words that were written. Um, that that even through his personality and his own uh, situation and circumstance, as he wrote this letter, uh, uh, God was writing this as well, and and that's why we accept this as the word of God today, uh, and and so with all the scriptures, and so we see sometimes we don't understand how is it that. It is both Paul and God doing it. We don't understand, but we believe that it is both true. We know what it is, but we don't understand how it is. And so in this statement here of being joined to his uh, his suffering, sharing his sufferings, and, and being joined to his resurrection, attaining this resurrection, how does it work? We may not have the answer, but what exactly is happening? I think we do have an answer. And, and I think we... We, we may not understand exactly how God ties these things together, but we must see these truths as they are, as they are and, and, and understand what God is doing. So let's uh, turn to Romans 6 together to understand a little bit more about this uh, uh, theology of uh, being joined to Christ and his death, uh, that, that we may uh, uh, also be joined to his resurrection and new life. Here we are in uh, Romans chapter 6, uh, a beautiful part of the book of Romans, an incredible book, vast book. And, and here uh, Paul is addressing this, this concern that he has, that he, he realizes uh, an argument may people, people may have or, or something may, people may come to him with. And that is saying, well, if, uh, if grace is there to, to cover us, then surely we should sin more that there would be more grace. And he says, of course not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? From verse 3. Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. So already in the introduction, we're getting a hint to what he's talking about in terms of this death and this new life. It says, for if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, you see the likeness of his death. This is a, uh, it's, it's a metaphorical language, but it's a real thing that is happening at the same time. It says, we united with him in the likeness of death, we will also certainly be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Since a person who has died is free from sin, now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So here we see this beautiful dynamic of of being united uh, to Christ in death and being united with him in resurrection and the newness of life. 
And, and so we see in this that you and I who are in Christ, if we uh, have believed and trusted in Christ, we uh, have this hope, we have this goal, and that is to share in, in, in the, the sufferings of Christ and in his death. And, and, and in that dying, it means dying to the old self, dying to our, uh, the, the sinful life, the, dying to the old man, uh, literally, as it says. And so we die to fear. We die to selfishness. We die to pr pride. We, we die to greed. We die to this always striving and never being fulfilled. We die to, to the, the living for me, myself, and I. We die to, to uh, being slaves to sin. We, we are dead to the old slave master. He has no rule over us anymore. Sin is a terrible slave master. Remember in the Garden of Eden, the first sin, uh, Satan tempted and and he he allured uh, uh, Adam and Eve to sin and to take the fruit. And what does he do immediately after? There's a condemnation. There's a a condemnation and a, 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 a that hangs over them. There's a, a a shame that comes over them. And how often have you experienced that where you have the sense, oh, it will be nice to do this. Oh, I should do that. But then you do it. And immediately after condemnation hits you and you feel guilty and you feel terrible and you feel weighed down by this sin and you feel trapped in the cycle of doing the same thing over and over and over. But in Christ, we are free to that. There is a, a resurrection power that we can live above that sin. We can break free from that sin. We can live free from condemnation hanging over us. The worst thing you or I have ever done yesterday is yesterday is put behind us because of what Christ has done, because he has paid the price and because he has severed the root. He has, he has cut the root and, 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 and rendered that sin dead. And so it no longer has to have power over us. And, and we know that as something that is dead can still wriggle and writhe and cause much damage uh, and, and will do so for the the remainder of our lives, but we know it is dead and, it, and, and, and we will win the victory certainly in the end. And so may your goal uh, be joined to Paul's, to, to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming or, or uh, by whatever means possible to attain to the resurrection from among the dead. So in whatever suffering, whatever difficulty, whatever challenges, whether it's just by, by life itself or by uh, sin itself, we know that this will not last forever. We know that a victory is certain. We know that there is a, a resurrection life that we can live that is full of hope and full of expectation and full of faith uh, for the new life to come. And so may we live in this kind of newness of life today and always. God bless you. And we'll see you next time.